films as writer and director enabled him to freely use his talent for combining sympathy with humor, creating some of the most memorable moments in film history. Look for Charlie Chaplin in January on AMC. And for more information on the stars, write for American Movie Classics magazine. Send $11.95 to P.O. Box 2065, Marion, Ohio, 43305. Or call 1-800-535-7700 to order with your Visa or MasterCard. American Movie Classics magazine, the magazine of classic Hollywood. Coming soon on AMC. Dracula. A moment ago, I stumbled upon a most amazing phenomenon. Something so incredible, I mistrust my own judgment. Look. Dracula. The very mention of the name brings to mind things so evil, so fantastic, so degrading. You wonder if it isn't all a dream, a nightmare. Rats. 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 Thousands. Millions of them. But no, this is no dream. This is Dracula, the original terrifying story of a maniac and a man who lived after death, lived on human blood, took the form of a vampire bat, and lured innocent girls to a fate truly worse than death. Dracula? Oh, what, what's he done to you, dear? Tell me. He came to me. He opened a thing in his arms, and he made me drink. <laughs> Next on AMC, Bela Lugosi brings Bram Stoker's legendary vampire to life with terrifying results in the original screen classic, Dracula, co-starring Dwight Fry and Edward Van Sloan. Next on AMC. John Carradine, Louis Jordan, Francis Lederer, Lon Chaney Jr. and Frank Langella all did it, but only Bela Lugosi lived it. They all played Dracula on the screen, but only Lugosi made it his life's work. Bela Lugosi let Dracula consume the last 25 years of his life. He was born in Hungary, not far from the real Transylvania in the Carpathian Mountains. And when his work in organizing an actor's union made him a target for a new political regime, he fled to Germany and later on to the United States. He was a talented actor and quickly made a good name for himself. His stage career peaked when he was cast on Broadway in the title role of the movie we're going to see, Dracula. Now, since his English was not very good, he learned his lines phonetically, which was what helped to shape that slow rhythm and precise diction and the odd inflections that he brought to this role. When Universal decided to make the film version in the year 1931, the director of the movie, Todd Browning, first cast Lon Chaney as the bloodthirsty count, but after Chaney died, uh, Bela Lugosi beat out Paul Muni and Ian Keith, Conrad Veidt, and John Carradine for the role. This movie is full of gorgeous photography and unexpected moments, like when uh, Bela Lugosi passes through that series of cobwebs without breaking them, wolves and eerie footsteps, and occasional strains from Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake punctuate Dracula.
I say driver a bit slower. scariest creatures in Hollywood rise from their graves every Saturday at 3 p.m. <laughs> on Creepy Classics. Next time, Bela Lugosi stars in Edgar Allan Poe's classic Tale of Terror. The blood-curdling Murders in the Rue Morgue. Saturday at 3 on AMC's Creepy Classics. We are back, and I now have the opportunity to elaborate on a favorite subject of mine, the 1931 horror classic, I could say the classic of them all in the horror genre, Dracula. And we have with us today David Scowl, who is the author of Hollywood Gothic, an in-depth study of the legend of Dracula. It's put out by W.W. W. Norton and Company, and it's an extraordinary work. Uh, it takes us from the book form of Dracula to the great silver screen, the most famous Dracula, of course, being the 1931 film starring Bela Lugosi. Welcome to AMC, David. Thank you um, for having me. This book, what could I call it? A midnight snack, I think that okay, would be a great idea. Okay, let's call it a midnight snack. Uh, for all of us vampire fans, and I've been one of those since I saw this, um, well, when I was a little teeny boy. Dracula was made at the beginning of the Depression, uh, 19... 31. 31, it was just yes. coming out of 1929's mm -hmm. Depression. And the public really wanted to forget about all their troubles. We can see that. Now, was this why Universal uh, was hesitant to produce it as a movie? Well, uh, Universal and most of the other studios uh, had mixed feelings about Dracula because it was a great uh, success on the Broadway stage and on tour around the country. It was making millions and, uh, uh, and, and was really a phenomenon. Uh, but they couldn't relate it to anything that they had done before in Hollywood uh, in the silent era. Uh, Hollywood had many uh, monstrous uh, characters, but they were always revealed as human. With Dracula, they had to deal with, uh, can the public accept a totally supernatural premise, uh, a human vampire 500 years old from Transylvania, and uh, the consensus was that the public would not accept it. I mean, Hollywood was very, then as today, was a very conservative place. Uh, and unlike the European tradition where the, uh, the irrational and the bizarre uh, and, uh, and macabre had been part and parcel of the German cinema and the French cinema from the beginning, uh, Hollywood didn't have this tradition. So they felt it was a, it was a big risk and uh, they held off uh, uh, making it. Now, why was Bela Lugosi so associated with this role? I mean, he had been an actor before that, doing completely different roles. Yes, he uh, had specialized in uh, romantic parts and uh, Shakespearean roles uh, in his native Hungary and came to the States in the 20s. Uh, and when the uh, actor uh, who had played Dracula in London, Raymond Huntley, turned down the chance to, to, to do it on Broadway, uh, Lugosi was uh, discovered and... Uh, and the rest was history. He uh, uh, toured it around the country uh, for, uh, for a couple of years. And, uh, but then, as today, having a stage success doesn't guarantee you a movie part. Isn't that always the yes. way? You, know, you would think that they would go right for Bela Lugosi to no, cast it in the he movie, was the but last other choice. actors were considered, and you mentioned that in the book. Um, Conrad Veidt was the, right. the original. Uh, Universal was going to do it as a, uh, a sumptuous uh, um, kind of super production. Uh, with Conrad Veidt as the star, and uh, uh, he didn't want to do talkies. Uh, his English was not uh, uh, perfected, and he saw what happened to a lot of European stars with the coming of talkies, so he went back to Germany. Uh, Lon, Lon Chaney Sr. Lon Chaney Sr. Uh, was the, uh, the second choice. Um, he unfortunately uh, uh, died of cancer shortly before the film was made. Uh, well, those are people you would expect to be chosen for the role of Dracula, but some of the others... That oh, yeah, yeah. They, uh, d you wonder what was going through their minds because they, uh, the executives at Universal seemed to have an idea that Dracula could be played as kind of a gangster or a thug, and they offered it to Paul Muni and to uh, Chester Morris. Boston Blackie. Boston Blackie himself. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the mind reels. And yes, sort of it certainly does. And Lugosi finally uh, was chosen at the last minute 
and I think probably because he could be had very cheaply. They had really just blown all the money they had budgeted on this production. Um, the studio almost folded. This was the worst year of the Great Depression, and um, you know they uh, you know could barely squeak through the production of this thing. Let me get back to that a little yeah. bit later if I can, uh, but. Keeping in, in, in context with the way Hollywood changes things, how, how did Hollywood change the image of Dracula himself? I mean, not considering Lugosi in this or anybody else mm -hmm. who might have played, but the image itself is, is, is divergent from the Bram Stoker Oh, novel. absolutely. Stoker himself diverged from um, earlier concepts of the vampire. His Dracula, people often forget, was not, he was not a seducer. He was not attractive. He was a cadaverous old man who he'd become younger as he drank blood, but he never became attractive. Uh, and it was almost as if uh, the adapters for the stage and f for, uh, for films felt that something was missing. And so uh, in the, the 1920s stage adaptations of Dracula, he becomes a uh, kind of a suave Mephisto in evening clothes, which Bram Stoker never envisioned. Uh, but it seemed to, to work and harken back to an older uh, uh, Byronic uh, mm. Interpretation. Of Not the only the evening clothes, but that cape with the with the collar. Tell it. That's you, you interesting. The yes. collar in the book. The collar, well, as every you know, buddy from the age of uh, five on knows that if you uh, have a vampire, he has to have a cape with a big stand-up yeah. collar on it. And you know what this has to do with drinking blood or anything is is uh, um, a mystery until you look back to the stage versions. And that costume was it was a stage trick. Uh, in order that he might disappear in plain view of the audience, uh, Dracula would turn his back to the, uh, to the house and a trap door would open and he had to have this big collar that would cover the back of his head so he could just kind of disappear in a puff of smoke. Uh, now this, so it was a, a, a completely a stage trick uh, that had no meaning whatsoever in a film adaptation. But, uh, but it's stuck, and it's become a signature feature of vampire costuming sure for all did. time. Now, Bram Stoker will always be remembered for Dracula, but he wrote other things as well that a lot of people are Yes, he about. wrote 18 books uh, altogether um, in his spare time, because his, his major commitment in life was uh, to uh, Henry Irving, the great uh, Victorian uh, Shakespearean actor. He, uh, Stoker managed uh, the Lyceum Theater for almost 30 years. Uh, and um, he obviously was a person of prodigious energy to be able to, um, uh, to write all these novels. Dracula is, is really the only of his fictions that has really uh, stood the test of time. It's never been out of print. Um, and we're coming up on the uh, centenary in uh, 1997. And I, Dracula lives. Uh, Dracula always lives. Uh, there, there's no bottom. How did, now, you mentioned uh, briefly before that uh, Dracula saved Universal from bankruptcy. Do you want to just elaborate on that a little? Um, yes. 1931 was actually the only year in the 1930s that Universal uh, uh, made a profit. And it's, um, it, it's amazing to think what, uh, how Hollywood history would have been changed if uh, the decision uh, to make Dracula had, had, had not happened uh, because the uh, the Universal Horror series of the 30s led directly into the science fiction things in, in later decades, which led directly to you know many of the uh, uh, the greatest blockbusters of all time, the things that Steven Spielberg and others have uh, have made. This uh, so Dracula is a real milestone in American cinema, not because of its technical innovations, but because it liberated uh, a whole imaginative approach. To, uh, to filmmaking. Now, while this was being done, this is really interesting in the book, while Dracula was being done with Bela Lugosi in the daytime, something mm -hmm. else was happening at night, and it wasn't the vampire sleeping in his coffin. That's right. The, uh, in order to uh, maintain the foreign market, which was a snap in, the, um, uh, in silent days, because film was really an international meeting, just changed the, sure. change the, uh, the title cards, uh, Universal and the other studios were producing simultaneous foreign language versions of their domestic product. And uh, the foreign audiences had no interest in seeing dubbed films. I mean, the attraction of talking pictures was to see real actors speaking in their natural voices. So these alternate versions of many films, most of which have now been, been lost, uh, were made um, in German, French, and primarily in Spanish. And an amazing Spanish language version of Dracula was produced on the same sets at night with a completely different cast and crew. And to make it even more interesting, it was in many ways a rival production. So it uh, looks and feels and sounds uh, 
uh, different than the American film and is in many technical ways a vastly superior film. Are there any existing film. prints of that today? Yes, there's one uh, print that isn't complete at the Library of Congress that uh, is in otherwise in, in beautiful shape. And a complete print uh, exists at the uh, Cinemateca de Cuba in uh, Havana. And I uh, had the great uh, uh, fortune to be able to get a visa to go down and, and mm -hmm. study it. Uh, there's a lot of interest in the film. Uh, many film festivals would like to uh, stage revivals of it. And I think uh, we likely will uh, be seeing more of the Spanish Dracula. Who was in that film? Well, uh, a stage actor from Spain named Carlos Villarías played uh, uh, Count Dracula. And a wonderful ingenue, uh, 17 years old from, from Mexico, named uh, Lupita Tovar, played uh, um, the Mina character, which was called Ava in uh, the Spanish film. And uh, I have been able to spend time with her and uh, reminisce about the film a bit. And uh, it's a remarkable thing because it, uh, uh, the photography and, and, and art direction especially are, are far superior to the American film. It was filmed in 1930, but looks in many ways like a noir film from the mid-1940s. Wonderful. Yeah, you have some great pictures of that, and it's like a strange deja vu to see that set with the different actor. Huh? Oh, the film is fascinating because it's like walking into a familiar house or castle and discovering all these strange rooms you never knew were there before. Is it as good as the American version? In many ways, it's better. Really? In many ways, it's better. Uh, it doesn't have the Lugosi performance, uh, although Carlos Villarreal's uh, uh, is a credible double for Lugosi in many ways. But uh, to watch what uh, films were really capable of in a technical sense, and in terms of uh, lighting and camera work and editing, uh, is a revelation because much of the criticism of 